Chapter 2. An Old Family Friend. June 27, 2060. The Colony, Kansas, North America. It was the hottest time of the year, so most people did their work and activities at night. Once the sun went down, the temperatures outside of XCOM HQ fell to a chilly 95 degrees Fahrenheit. It was safe to step out from underneath the protective coverings and rooftops, although the ground would remain hot enough to burn feet until very late at night. Akira's parents were, as always, busy. They separated from the main group and joined a gathering of men and women in a meeting hall near the center of the headquarters. Since Asuna and Alexander were adults, they were free to do what they wanted, and they did just that. Asuna took Chris by the hand, and they slipped off to a different building in the complex. Akira knew she wouldn't see them again until the following night. Alexander joined his parents at the big important meeting, carrying a floppy manila folder stuffed with paperwork under his arm. As for the younger Robinson children, Akira found herself in a situation that had one very bad side and one very good side. Before leaving for their meeting, Blake and Chihiro entrusted Akira to the care of Inez Vasquez. This was good, because Inez was close friends with Emmanuel Espinosa. Akira's imagination ramped into overdrive as she mentally planned out all of the ways she could remove Inez from the equation and be alone with Emmanuel. But then there was the bad side. James and Josiah were also going to be there, and no amount of planning could work on them. Inez lived in a tenement house with nearly two dozen other people. The building itself used to be a barracks from the Second Hyperspace War, but in the intervening years, someone built walls to separate the many beds from one another, creating over two dozen small, cell-like rooms. A central hallway ran the length of the barracks, connecting all of the rooms to the public bathrooms and the communal shower. The twins barreled into the tenement with the force of a tornado, almost crashing into an old man who was on his way out. He waved a bottle of beer angrily at the twins, cursing. Uh, sorry, Bradford, Inez gasped as she followed the twins inside. Uh, the Robinsons are back, huh? grumbled John Bradford, the former central officer of XCOM. <sighs> Guess I should go see how long we've delayed the inevitable this time. And hey, Nezzy, keep those two cretins on a leash, won't you? As Bradford left, Inez and Akira looked around to see that the twins were barely inside of the tenement and already causing chaos. The doorway to the communal showers had just swung open, and Scarlet Freeman walked directly into the ambush. Dressed in a pair of bath towels, one wrapped around her body and one round her head, Scarlet recoiled at the sight of the twins. Oh no, not you again! she moaned. Sniggering and laughing, the twins descended on Scarlet, teasing and bullying her with not a breath of remorse. The older twin grabbed Scarlet's hair and pulled so hard she shrieked. Hey, it's Rope Girl, Josiah teased. Where's the rope? What'd you do with it? He grabbed a handful of Scarlet's hair and tugged, searching for the braids Scarlet used to be known for, making her scream and sob. I don't braid my hair anymore. Scarlet cried, leave me alone. Akira ran forward and put her shoulder into Josiah's side, shoving him to the floor. You heard her, leave her alone, Akira barked at Josiah. Scarlet scampered into her room and slammed the door while the twins stared slack-jawed at their sister. Uh, you'd better apologize for that, Kira, James growled. Akira simply flipped a very rude hand gesture at James before walking back to Inez. Can we go somewhere before I kill those two, Nezzy? Anywhere's fine. And that was how, about ten minutes later, Akira and Inez found themselves outside, making their way up to the roof. The sun went down several hours ago, and the ground was finally cool enough to walk on with bare feet. Inez and Akira wandered around the flat rooftop, overlooking the town, and played catch-up. So I heard your familia was in Africa, Inez said. What was that thing your dad said he found? An atmosphere generator, Akira replied. We found it in a Vanian starship that crashed near Lagos. That's in Nigeria. 
Inez pulled the power cord on one of the industrial fans, letting cool air wash over them both. Oh, that's so exciting, she declared. Don't see how, Akira snorted. Hell, I don't even know what an atmosphere generator is supposed to do. Inez put her hands on her hips and looked down at Akira. Wait, they haven't told you? Akira laughed. My parents haven't told me a lot of things, Nezzy. They're too busy with that stupid project, whatever it is. You know they never told me where babies come from? I learned it from the twins. Even in the darkness, Akira could see that Inez was looking scandalized. Oh, la niña sagrada, Inez cursed. That's muy malo. It's okay, Akira shrugged. Mom and Dad are making up for it. Dad promised I'd get to fly the angel when I turned 15, and I've been reminding him on and off for months now. He won't forget that. Inez shook her head. It's, it's not that, little niña. The project is so important to your padre and mamá. It's, well, well, how do I explain it? It's their legacy. Their legacy and their gift to you and your siblings. It's the terraforming engine. Terraforming engine? Akira repeated. I've heard of something like that before, but why? Why would mom and dad build one? Not just your parents, XCOM, Inez clarified. They think it's their last best hope for fixing the world. If they can get this thing running, the world will cool off. The ozone layer will come back, and none of us will have to live in a scorching hellhole anymore. That's why they're helping XCOM build one inside the headquarters. Inez gestured to the silhouette of XCOM HQ in the darkness. If this thing works, you'll get to grow up in a temperate world. You can go out in the daylight instead of skulking about in the dark like this. Akira scoffed. You might like it, but I've never been cold before. I totally freak out if the world cools off. And what about heavy clothes? Do they really slow you down? Akira had seen plenty of pictures of people wearing winter weather gear, and it simply didn't make sense to her. The heaviest article of clothing she'd ever worn in her life was a rain jacket, and Akira could count on one hand the number of times she'd actually put it on. Unlike Inez, or any of her siblings for that matter, Akira was not old enough to remember what the world was like before the beginning of nuclear summer. You'll be fine, Inez laughed. You'll really freak out when you see it's possible to feel cold in the daylight, too. Then, Inez put a friendly hand on Akira's shoulder. This might just be the last birthday you have in the dark, Akira. Can you believe it? Are you ready for the day when you can walk around in the sunlight without being killed by it? Akira leaned back and looked up at the night sky. The combined layer of haze and dry fog in the air obscured all but the brightest stars. Huh, I'll believe it when I see the heavens for real. June 28th, 2060. What? Just a small party? But, but, but you're turning 15. Yeah, I know. Akira and Scarlet were sitting inside the dining hall at XCOM HQ, about 30 feet below ground level where it was cooler. They weren't alone. Scarlet's parents were at the next table, chatting with Blake and Shihiro. Julian, the android, was sitting at Akira's table just a short distance away from her. Scarlet, who had just asked Akira about her birthday plans, didn't notice her spoon was tipped sideways and some cucumber soup was dribbling down her front. I thought, like, all girls threw these big, huge celebrations when they turned 15. Scarlet stammered, Isn't it, like, tradition or something? Julian leaned over to interrupt. It is a human tradition in certain cultures, the android said. If Miss Robinson was of Latin American descent, she might have considered throwing a fiesta de quinceañera, a mass celebration with hundreds of guests. The option is still available, as my personality database suggests Tech Sergeant Inez Vasquez would be open to the idea and is willing to assist. Shut up, Akira said to Julian. Look, Scar, I don't want a big birthday party. I just want, uh, you know, I just want one or two specific people to come and hang out with me for a few hours. This did not produce the reaction Akira was expecting. 
The smile on Scarlet's face suddenly flickered, and it seemed to be very forced. Her left eyelid twitched a minuscule amount. Akira locked eyes with her friend. Hey, something wrong? Scarlet overreacted, pretending to choke on a non-existent bite of food. No, no, I I'm okay. It, 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 it's nothing. At that moment, Julian stood up and approached Scarlet, metal arms outstretched. As much as I find your suffering mildly entertaining, my programming compels me to intervene against my will. It was Akira's turn to fake an emotion. While she struggled to stop Julian from giving Scarlet an unnecessary Heimlich maneuver, she wondered exactly what part of her statement had caused Scarlet to shut down. Akira found herself wishing she could read minds. Later in the evening, as the sun was starting to go down, the whole Robinson family gathered together for a short meeting. Standing in the entrance hall, Chihiro said, So, Blake and Akira, both of you are having your birthdays on Wednesday. Have you picked a place for the party? Blake took a step back and pointed to his daughter. You know me, Chi. Akira gets first pick. Akira's face got red. It was a tradition as old as she was. Ever since she was born on her father's birthday, Blake had always chosen to give up his own celebration to make Akira's big day even better. She hugged him and said, oh, Well, I want to have a picnic in the river park. Alexander clapped his hands excitedly. Good idea, he said. I saw a merchant caravan go through the gate this morning. There's probably a lot of cool foreign food in the trade center right now. And how many people do you want to invite? Chihiro asked, pulling a notepad out of her pocket. Just two, Akira replied. Chris Wright and Emmanuel Espinosa. Blake and Chihiro both stiffened. Alex was confused while Asuna gave a wide smile at the mention of her boyfriend's name. James and Josiah looked at one another and raised their eyebrows. Finally, the parents, in a concerned tone of voice, replied, Uh, Akira, Chris and Emmanuel are... Uh, they're fully grown men, Blake said. Don't you want to invite someone your own age? Someone like that lovely Freeman girl, Chihiro suggested. Sensing she was pushing her luck too far, Akira quickly tried to offer a compromise. She wasn't willing to give up on having Emmanuel at the party, but she was ready to give a little ground. Uh, okay, sure. Scar can come, and maybe Nezi too, if she brings Julian. Chihiro gave Akira a very quizzical look. Is that it? No one else? This is your 15th we're talking about, Akira. It should be a special occasion. Akira put on the biggest, cheeriest smile she could muster. And it will be, she replied. That's why I invited people who are special to me. In reality, Akira wanted a single moment with just one person. But if that meant putting up with a slightly larger crowd, then so be it. She would just play the cards she was dealt. Meanwhile, Blake and Chihiro were looking at one another as though they were having a silent conversation. Finally, Blake relented. He turned to speak to Asuna, making sure to spell out his next request with his hands. All right, it's your birthday, and you'll get the party you wanted. Chi, Asuna, can you take Akira to the Trade Center? Get enough food for a, a night-long party. He passed the large pouch to his wife. It jingled with the sound of many coins rattling together. Once the sun went down and the heat of the day broke, the colony's Trade Center came to life. It was a large plaza, covered in awnings as usual, surrounded on three sides by storefronts where merchants and traders peddled their goods. When Chihiro, Asuna, and Akira arrived, the plaza was already brimming with people. Some 500 men and women bustled about, shopping and bartering and trading. Chihiro opened up the bag her husband gave her and distributed its contents to Akira and Asuna. Each girl received 50 United Nations credits. The credits themselves were in the shape of coins made from a bronze aluminum alloy. The head side depicted a profile of Jericho, while the tail side contained the insignia of the United Nations, a map of Earth encircled by twin olive branches and the words, Established 2035. 
I know we're supposed to be buying food and party supplies, Chihiro said, but I'm not going to ask you to give back the leftover money when we're done. It was a pre-birthday shopping spree worthy of the old world. Akira and Asuna went from one food vendor to the next, stocking up on salted meats for what was rapidly starting to look like a birthday cookout. Once they did a lap around the storefronts, Akira, Asuna, and Shihiro turned their attention to the central plaza. Just as Alex had mentioned, a merchant caravan had pulled into the trade center. Eight vehicles, mostly trucks, had pulled into the middle of the plaza, and merchants were selling their goods directly off the backs of their vehicles. Some food items were strangely shaped, others strangely colored, and a few were just plain weird. What the hell is that thing? Akira squeaked, pointing towards a strange batch of fruits one man was selling. Oh, pomegranates! Chihiro gasped in delight. I haven't eaten one of those in about 20 years! And she proceeded to buy a dozen of them. All was going well as the night wore on, and the trio continued their shopping. But about an hour before midnight, right when the trade center was about to hit peak activity, a voice called out that made Chihiro halt in her tracks, and by extension, so did Akira. When Asuna realized her family wasn't pulling up the rear anymore, she stopped and looked around. Tachibana? Someone called to the Robinsons. Corporal Tachibana of the Avenger? A tall, bony man with a gaunt face pushed through the crowd and greeted Chihiro. For a moment, Akira's mother stared directly into the man's skull-like features before a smile of recognition dawned on her face. Von Unfall? Chihiro breathed. Bernard Von Unfall? No way! I thought you were dead! And I you, replied the man in a German accent. As Chihiro and the stranger hugged, Akira and Asuna hung back, looking at one another nervously. Did you know Mom had another friend? Akira signed to her sister. He seems creepy. Asuna replied silently, hiding her hand behind her bag of groceries and hand-spelling a quick reply. I think he is creepy, too. At that moment, Chihiro introduced Bernard to her children. These are my daughters, Asuna and Akira. Bernard took Asuna's hand in his own, and with his super creepy bony face, he kissed the top of Asuna's knuckles. Then he looked up and spoke in elaborate German. Asuna let out a weak giggle before she opened her mouth and spoke in very poor, halting English. I am named Asuna. I'm deaf. She covered her ear with one hand and shook her head to get the point across. Bernard raised an eyebrow before he nodded in understanding. Then the strange man looked at Akira. She looked right into his face and did not like what she saw. Bernard von Unfall's face was already sunken and sallow, but his ghoulish appearance was magnified a hundredfold by the fact that his eyes were gray. Not that kind of faded blue some people had. These eyes were nearly devoid of all color. Akira knew this was not a natural eye color for humans. The color of Bernard's eyes signified something important, but in that moment she couldn't remember what it was, or why. All Akira knew was that when she looked into those seemingly dead eyes, her mind was filled with all kinds of dark and disturbing thoughts. However, there was one more thing Akira found alarming about this guy. Even though she was facing him head-on, she could see some kind of technologically sophisticated device attached to the back of his head. Two metal arms snaked around Bernard's skull and rested atop his ears in much the same way as the arms on a pair of glasses do. Akira found the sight to be very unnerving. And what is your name, young lady? he asked. Akira felt a chill running up her spine, and it came with a very powerful impulse to run away. Fighting down her reflexes, Akira managed to choke out her own name. Unlike Asuna, Bernard held his grip on Akira's hand far longer, staring into her eyes the entire time. Ultimately, 
Shihiro had to make him let go. Blake will be happy to see you too, she said. How long will you be here? Maybe we can have a proper reunion. To Akira and Asuna's dismay, Bernard said he would be in the colony all week, and that he would be most happy to visit the Robinsons at XCOM HQ. When the girls finally parted ways with Bernard, Akira grabbed her mother by the hand and forcefully pulled Shihira away from the Trade Center. Akira looked back only once as she left the scene, and what she saw nearly made her heart stop. As she, Chihiro, and Asuna were walking away, Bernard pulled some kind of device out of his pocket. It was a small, handheld computer, connected via electrical cable to a handheld contraption that resembled an old-world microphone. Bernard was pointing this device directly at the Robinsons while looking down at his screen. Akira was so frightened she couldn't speak. Akira ended up going to bed just before the sun rose. She had nothing else to do because her mother insisted on letting the birthday girl relax while her parents set up the party. So Akira went back to the tenement. When she arrived, she could hear Inez Vasquez gossiping with somebody through the walls. So Akira just went to her own room and flopped down on the bed. Sometime later, the sound of conversation stopped and Akira could feel sleep closing in on her. She tried to think about the strange encounter with Bernard von Unfall in the Trade Center again. Something about this guy just seemed wrong to her, but she couldn't pin it down exactly. Akira punched her pillow and tried to get comfortable, but as she settled into bed, a new sound reached her ears. Footsteps in the hallway. This was normal as some two dozen other people lived in the tenement building. Akira could hear voices talking, and she tried to ignore them, but her interest was piqued when somebody mentioned her own name. And what about the younger one? I think her name was Akira? Akira felt her skin crawling. That was the voice of Bernard von Unfall. What was he doing here? Oh, I've known her since she was very small. The second voice belonged to Emmanuel Espinosa. Akira's heartbeat quickened, and she felt herself getting very hot all of a sudden. She takes after her mother a lot, Emmanuel went on. She even has Chihiro's eyes. Yes, Bernard sounded like he was feigning interest. You may be too young to remember, Espinosa, but I fought alongside Tachibana during the war. I was part of the squad that silenced the chosen warlock once and for all. Oh, I know, Emmanuel's voice said through the walls. What's your point? My point is this. I learned enough about the universe during the war to know that young Akira is the kind of person I'm interested in. I want to get closer to her, to learn more. You're a friend of the Robinson family. Can you help me, Espinosa? Akira heard all of this through the wall and suddenly started feeling very sick. She wondered if she could get out of bed and hold her door shut without being heard. But it turned out to be unnecessary. Emmanuel's response was just forceful enough that she could hear every single word. Not a snowflake's chance on earth, Von Unfall. Chihiro might not know what kind of man you became after the war, but I can see the truth in your eyes. The work you do leaves marks on your soul. Don't go anywhere near that girl. And if I find out you did, I won't be very civil with you. A single set of footsteps retreated towards the door and were gone. From the sound of it, Emmanuel lurked in the hallway outside of Akira's door for a few minutes. Minutes that felt like centuries, while Akira wrestled with the urge to burst out of her own room and kiss Emmanuel right then and there. By the time Akira found the willpower to act on her impulses, it was too late. The sound of a door being opened and closed reached her ears just as she stepped out of her room and into the hallway. Emmanuel was gone again, leaving Akira so deep in love that she might just drown in her own passion.